Praise God. I, I told Brother Young, I said, I, or Brother White, I said, I have often found that when service is going to erupt totally, that I have a hard time finding a sermon or feeling a definite direction. But when I feel something very definite, then I know that it's time to preach. The church said, Amen. And uh, thank God for what we're doing here. We're just going to give you a little instructions tonight. And uh, let the Lord help us. Praise God. It's not through. Praise God. I said it's not through. Amen. And the Lord, the Lord wants to speak to us in a very definite manner. And uh, I'm, I'm asking him to uh, open our understanding tonight to the word of the Lord. Amen. I want you to lift your hands and your voice just a moment, and I want you to pray with me right now that the will of Almighty God would be done in the service tonight. Would you do that right now? In Jesus' name, praise God. Lord, we love you. We give you glory and honor. We praise your holy name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's pray just a little bit more, would you, in Jesus' name. Praise God. I know it's a little different, but I'm asking you to pray just a little more, if you would, please. Amen. Praise God. We love you, Jesus. We hunger for you, Lord. We need you, Father. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 If you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me to the first book of Chronicles. First Chronicles. I'm going to read part of chapter 13. And we're going to talk to you about something I feel very, very important tonight. Amen. And uh, anybody interested in the glory of the Lord tonight? I, I want you to understand that the presence of God dwells everywhere. The presence of God dwells everywhere. But the glory of the Lord will not abide just anywhere. Now, I hope you can understand what I'm saying. There are many people who boast that they feel the presence of God in the church service. But we must be careful in using the presence of God as a yardstick or an approval of God up upon our services or upon our lives. I'm convinced that anybody that's got breath can praise God enough and feel the presence of God. Amen. But when it comes to God's glory... It's a totally different situation. And it's good to feel the presence of God. And even Moses told the Lord, said, I will not go up unless your presence goes with me. But more than your presence, I want you to show me thy glory. Amen. And uh, that's what we're hungry for tonight is not just to feel the presence of God, but for the glory of the Lord to feel this place. The glory of God is a, a very intense, very dense presence of God in such a manner that something visible happens or there is a certain expression of the spirit. Amen. Praise God. I hope you're hungry for this tonight. I really do. I hope you're hungry for it. Amen. And uh, I know we could do a lot of other things, but uh, I want the Lord to talk to us tonight. Praise God. First Chronicles chapter 13. David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. 
and let us bring again the ark of our God to us. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. Everybody say, the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant. Amen. I'm not take the time to go into it. We need to redeem as much time as possible. But if you'll notice the story, <clears throat> um, a man dies because he touched something that God required us not to touch. And then a little later on, after three months of the blessings of God in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, the Bible says that David come back after the ark. And this time when he come after it, he come with tremendous rejoicing and singing and, and music and dancing. The Bible says that he went six paces. He offered a sacrifice unto the Lord of fatlings and oxen. And then he danced before the Lord with all of his might. Six more paces, historians say. He offered another sacrifice, and then he danced before the Lord with all of his might. Amen. I want to preach to you tonight by the help of the Holy Ghost, and if, if you get too tired, I'll stop and finish it tomorrow night. Amen. <clears throat> but I want to preach to you tonight about the seventh step. The seventh step. Amen. I told Brother White, I said, I hope, and I, I don't say this to belittle you, but I hope that I don't preach something that you cannot relate to. I want you to grasp what the Holy Ghost is saying. I'm preaching to a divided group. I'm preaching to some that are hungry and some that are just here. Amen. I would pray that everybody here, there would be such a visitation of God that it would whip our appetite till we all wanted to experience the glory of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. And... I, I want to talk to you about some things tonight. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. God bless you for standing in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Are you glad for the touch of the Holy Ghost? Amen. Aren't you glad you can rejoice in the house of the Lord? Have y'all already clocked out on me that quick? Amen. Aren't you glad for the presence of God and the, the victory that's in the house of the Lord? Amen. I've already told you that David, being a man after God's own heart, in other words, desiring the things that God desired. I have often heard people talk about being filled. They that thirst and hunger after righteousness shall be filled. There needs to be and there must be an overwhelming desire in all of our lives to seek for what is right. Amen. Not what I can get by with. Not what I can go around. But he that seeks and searches after righteousness, being right with God, shall be filled. Amen. My heart's desire tonight is to love the things that God loves and to hate the things that God hates and to be in right standing with God. Amen. And whatever God loves, I want to have a love for it. Whatever God puts a premium on, I want to put a premium on it. I want to look through the eyes of the Spirit. I want to have the attitude of God about the things that God has, has emphasized that are important to all of us. Amen. And David begins to inquire. He finds the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Abinadab. And uh, they begin to try to bring it. And of course, they trying to use the transport of their enemy and found out that it's not, it's not right to use what the enemy uses to move things that God has already instructed us through the law and the scripture to move. Amen. And so somebody innocent dies and David parks the Ark of the Covenant again at the house of Obed-Edom. And then after three months of hearing nothing but the blessings of God upon the house of Obed-Edom, David inquires of the Lord and how to bring the Ark of the Covenant and how to fetch it is the way the scripture says. And the Levites begin to tell him. The students of the law begin to instruct. It is to be upon the shoulders of the priest. The burden of it must be felt. You cannot take this and put it on something that the people do not feel the burden of it. Amen. It separates them from it. And so David, in, under the instruction of the law, 
begins to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David with gladness. I've already told you that he went about six paces. He had changed his attire from that of a king to that of a Levite. In six paces, he builds an altar, offers a sacrifice of fatling and oxen upon it, and then he begins to dance before the Lord with all of his might. If you're going to do anything for God, you've got to do it with all of your might. God is not interested in half-hearted anything. I wish some of you could catch what I'm saying right now. God is not interested in a half-hearted prayer or a half-hearted praise or a half-hearted worship or a half-hearted living for him. He said, if you really love me, you love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, praise God. Amen. Six more paces, and he offers again sacrifice, altar, blood, worship. Six more paces, altar, blood, and worship. Have you ever read over there in the book of Psalms where it said, Oh, ye be lifted up, ye everlasting gates. You doors, lift up your heads. For the king of glory shall come in. When David was bringing the ark home, those who were carrying the ark, the Levites carrying it, when they got to the gate of the city, they began to sing out to the porters and the watchers of the gate. They said, Be lifted up, ye everlasting gates, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And it was the responsibility of the watchers of the wall to cry back out to them in song, Who is the king of glory? And then the Levites would sing back to them, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. There's something about when the glory of God and that which is symbolic to his glory begins to move. Amen. There needs to be a song in the church when the glory of God's coming. There needs to be a celebration in the church when the glory of God is close at hand. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> Praise God. Amen. Up somewhere in the balcony looking out upon this time of celebration is one by the name of Michael. Bible says that when David finally got home that night, she begins to reproach him and tell him how glorious was the king of Israel in all the sight of the handmaidens today. You acted so foolish, and, and uh, it's, not, it's not the attitude of a king to act the way that you were acting. And the Bible says that Michael bare no child to David, amen, her womb was barren. It's not because that God shut up her womb. It's because that David refused to have relationship with her and to produce something through her that had the ability or the potential of not wanting to love God or desire the things of God. I'm telling some of you, you've been sitting around here long enough watching everybody else worship. If you're going to produce something for God, if you're going to have something effective for the kingdom of God, you're going to have to come out of your little window somewhere, get down to where everybody else is, and enjoy the presence of God. Praise God. I never found anywhere in the scripture it said, for the Father seeketh such to watch him. But I have found where it says, the Father seeketh such to worship him. God doesn't need any watchers. He needs worshipers. Oh, praise God. Amen. I want you to understand with me tonight that six is the number of man. David went six paces. He went to that place, that position, the number of man. And he understood, if I am to go any further, I cannot go in my own intellect or by my own understanding. If I'm going to go any further, I must take the seventh step. And the seventh step is beyond reason. And it's beyond the intellect. And it's even beyond human understanding. Stay with me just a second, amen. I've heard it preached all of my life, 666, and they're going to stamp that on your forehead. I really doubt that you go around somewhere with 666 stamped on your forehead. 666 is showing us that humanity has almost become complete like God. 
but not quite complete enough. It's showing us that humanity has come to a point that it's tried to work out its own salvation and its own redemption. But God is going to remind them, you're mighty close, but you're not close enough because there is only one thing that can bring completion. It is not by the power and the ability of humanity. The only thing that can bring completion is the divine purpose and will and even spirit of the living God. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how pretty you think you are. I don't care how much talent and ability you have. You are incomplete within yourself. You need the help of the Holy Ghost. Oh, praise God. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Somebody needs to remind us again of what the word of the Lord says. For it is not by might, nor is it by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. I understand and I agree with all of it. I thank God for all the abilities we have and talents that we have. I thank God for all of the leadership abilities and the structure that we have. But I got news for you. If the Holy Ghost is not there to complete it, it's sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. If the anointing of God is not upon it, I don't care how good it looks. I don't care how powerful it appears. We must have the help of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. David understood. I can only go so far. And the seventh step has to be done through God's divine order. Stay with me just a second. Praise God. I want you to notice that there are some things that have always been and always will be. Amen. First of all, you need a revelation that when God gave you the Holy Ghost, you become a king and a priest unto the Lord. Amen. David, who is symbolic not just of kingship, but also when he took off that royal apparel, he was letting us know, I'm not just a king, but I'm putting on the ephod of a Levite. Thank God that in this end time that God has given us the ability and the privilege, not just of kingship, which denotes his authority, but he's also allowed us the privilege to act as a high priest, to offer sacrifice unto God. Praise and worship unto God is not a penalty. Praise and worship unto God is not something you should do out of a grudging heart. But you ought to understand, I have a right to praise him. I have been called out of dirt into this marvelous light to exalt him and to praise him and to give him the sacrifice that he is worthy of. Now, I don't want to lose you here and I want you to, I want you to think with me just a second. Amen. You see, when that high priest when he got ready to come to the tabernacle, he did not come just any way that he wanted to come. There was a particular order that he had to have. There was something that he had to make sure that he had followed. Amen. The first thing that he had to do, the scripture says, is he had to come through his gates with thanksgiving. And the second thing is he entered his courts with praise. I got news for you. You don't just enter the presence of God any old way that you want to come. There is a divine order that God has established and you've got to come through that order. The first two steps is through thanksgiving and praise. That just brings you through the gate into the courtyard. The third thing that happened, the next thing that took place is that that high priest had to put a sacrifice on the brazen altar. It was symbolic to repentance. Blood had to be shed. If you was going to go any further in this, you had to understand it was paid with shed blood. I've got a message for somebody tonight. You may think you can go however you want to go, but the only way into the presence of God is by the blood of a spotless lamb. Oh, praise God. Amen. The next thing that happened is he come to the laver of water, which is a type of cleansing, the cleansing and the washing of the word, and also a type of water baptism. Amen. He's 
doing everything that he's been instructed to do. He has the power and the ability to do it. He's been given the right to do it. The next thing he does is he steps into the holy place. He has the candlesticks on one side. He has the shoe bread on the other. And in front of him before the veil is a golden altar with incense. And incense is burning and going up into the presence of God. Amen. Every one of these things are by God's divine order. Each of them play a significant role in the heart of every New Testament believer. Thank God for the altar. Thank God for the cleansing of water. Thank God for shoe bread. Thank God for candlesticks that light the way. Hallelujah. Praise God. But when that high priest got to the veil, he's standing there with blood in one hand. He has now picked up a burning censer in the other. He's standing before the veil, blood in his left hand and a burning censer in his right. But he has gone as far as the flesh can allow him to go. He has taken the sixth step. He's gone as far as he can go on his own power and on his own merit. Now he is faced with the veil of the flesh. He cannot go any further on his own talent, his own ability, or by his own progress. If he's going to go any further, he's got to have the help of the Spirit. The seventh step is the step of the Spirit. Praise God. I'm not here to strike swords with you in some theology. I've studied it and asked, I've asked rabbis even, is there an opening in the veil? It's debatable. Amen. Most agree that there was no opening in the veil. We talk about this rope. mythology. He said there was no rope, never has been a rope, never will be a rope. I said, how did he get past the veil? The Bible says it is attached by rings to the post. It stretched tight across. That's how come when Jesus Christ cried, it is finished. And the old high priest watched as the veil was rent from the top to bottom in twain. He marveled because he understood now there is an opening. Now there's entrance. Now there's a way in. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Again, I'm not here to try to argue with you, but as far as I can see in the Scripture and the way most Orthodox Jews feel, there was no opening in the veil. So how in the world did the high priest get from one side to the other? Amen. He understood something very important. I cannot go unless I come by God's divine order. I've come as far as I can go. I can't take another step. But there's two things I better have. I I better have blood and I better have worship. Oh, praise God. Now, I'm going to mess with you just a second. You see, the altar, the brazen altar, the outer court is symbolic to the flesh. And the holy place is symbolic to the soul of man. His emotional seat. Amen. That's the reason why that the brazen altar was in the outer court. It was to deal with the flesh and the works of the flesh. It was to deal with blood being shed and repentance and dying out to the flesh. Praise God. I know a lot of people who never get past the brazen altar altar they live their whole spiritual life always repenting 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 brother morgan don't you believe in repenting yes i believe in repenting i believe y'all repent every day but i believe there's a little more to the journey than just the brazen altar i'm gonna i'm, gonna, I'm just gonna unload on some of you here tonight amen our problem is not all of these things we debate over and these issues we debate over. Our problem is we have uncontrolled flesh and carnality rules in Pentecost. And so most of our spiritual experience is always allowing, I'm preaching to some of you young people right now, 
allowing the works of the flesh to rule in your life. So you can get no further in your spiritual experience with God than always having to come to a brazen altar because you have yet to crucify the works of the flesh. I'm losing some of you right here. Amen. Your whole spiritual journey, all you see about living for God is how bloody it is and how nasty it is at the altar. You have never yet to get beyond the brazen altar. The only thing you know about living for God is rules and legislation and do's and don'ts. That's all you comprehend about living for God. If I ask you, tell me about the church and the kingdom of God and the work of God and the things of God. Some of you couldn't get past hair length, sleeve length, and dress length. Because that's all you know. That's why the preacher's always having to preach to you and call you in the office and tell you, you need to straighten up. You need to quit doing that. You need to quit fornicating. You need to quit rebellion. You need to quit whacking, trimming, and all of it. Boom. It's because you have yet to get beyond the brazen altar. I feel an anointing of the Holy Ghost on me right now. I said, the only thing you comprehend about it is, I got to go back down there in blood. I got to go back down there and something's got to die. It's always a struggle with the flesh. It's always a battle with the flesh. Because you have lived totally in the fleshly arena. That's why it matters to you so much the way you look and your appearance and the fact that you don't want to look like a child of God. You would rather look like the world. It's because you have yet to crucify your flesh. And don't you think for one minute I'm afraid to preach about it. You don't intimidate me, you carnal flip in the least little bit. We're not careful. Our whole youth camps dwell around people that don't want to crucify the flesh and get beyond the brazen altar. I've got a message for somebody tonight. There is so much more to explore about God. If that's all you know about living for God, you haven't even got where it meets the road yet. You know what? I don't need something to sign or a UPC manual to tell me how to live. I'll tell you where I found out how to live. I stepped beyond the veil into the glory of God. And when I seen him, when I come out of there, I said, I want to be more like that than I want to be like this. Don't have to have a preacher holding a gun to my head telling me, you got to go get a haircut and you got to keep it trim. No, 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 no. Uh, that tells me you've got to comprehend. You've got to get past that brazen altar. You've got to come into a place where God opens himself to you. <laughs> Woo! Now just stay with me a second. That's the flesh. That's the arena of the flesh. You are a triunity. You are body, you are soul, and you are spirit. When Adam sinned in the garden, God said, the day you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. The day you eat, you'll die. We watch him eat the fruit. He did not die physically, but he died spiritually. The spirit man, that which relates to God, Amen. Now, now, just, just watch this. No man know the things of the Spirit, save the Spirit. It's impossible for you through your intellect or your reasoning to comprehend the things of God. I'm even talking about standards if you want to get there. It doesn't make a lick of sense to you. Why do I have to do that? Why do, can I go there? Why can I have this? It's because you're trying to view everything from outside. Oh 
It doesn't make a lick of sense. Let me tell you why. Because you are trapped in the arena of your flesh. The flesh doesn't want to do it. The flesh doesn't want to submit. The flesh doesn't want to die. That's why you got to grab it down to the brazen altar and lay it on there. And Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice. You kill it today, you'll have to kill it tomorrow. Now, if some of us get past the flesh, the next arena is the arena of the soul. It's the emotion of man. Why do you think that they call it soul music? Some of these words, I'm going to preach about music now. It's where your emotional seat is. If you only live for God out of emotionalism, you're going to be doing this. I can prove it to you. I could have Brother Will Banks of this choir come back up here and they could sling a, sing a slow song and everybody be snotting and crying and boohooing. And within 30 seconds time, they can change the tempo and upbeat it. And we go from snotting and crying to shouting. I can tell you a sad story and you're weeping and crying. And then I turn right around and tell you something funny and make you laugh. It's because that's where your emotions dwell. Now listen to me. In the holy place... There was some divine light, but there was still some natural light. There was still some physical and intellectual understanding, but there is now a little divine revelation and a little spiritual understanding. Most of our services stop in the holy place. <clears throat> Emotional, high, exciting. Right. We get a little of the spirit, but we still got a whole lot of natural light. And you can still fornicate and come and just shout away. <clears throat> you shout with the best of them. And I'm not trying to be mean to you. Just, just stay with me a second. Hey Amen. And it stops right there. Boy, I, I felt good, didn't you? Boy, I felt good. How about you? Yeah, I really felt good. Feelings will get you in trouble. <laughs> and that's why I said, and don't misunderstand me. I don't want, brother, you guys don't misunderstand me. I, you cannot get to the spirit saved through your emotions. It has to start somewhere. If you're going to worship or praise God, you've got to praise him with some emotional stuff, some feeling to it. Not advocating that you can go around all of this. It has to come through all that. And that includes your body. You can't sit there like a knot on a log and get into the Holy of Holies. You can't sit there like you don't know what's going on. Well, I'm just going to do it from my heart. No, 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 you don't. He said, if you're going in here, it includes your body and it includes your emotions. Well, I just sat here. If God wants me to go in there, he snatched me up by the hair of the head and fling me in there. It don't work that way. You going to stay with me for a while? That's where a lot of people stop right there. They get a little, little goose bump turned on and a little feeling and they get excited and whoo, my God, didn't we have church? Well, you only got to the holy place. <laughs> you've, you, you, you've done everything that we can do. Right. Now, come on here. You know, y'all want to sit down just a second? Now, you, whatever. Now, you tell me. You tell me. I know enough about preaching to the grandstands to know the key words, key expressions, and to hit it just right, and you can get Pentecostal people to come to their feet. Not feel an ounce of nothing. Just if you hit the right thing, get to talking about the name. I know a name that's out of the sound of swift of the speed. It's older than age and better than good. It's curse of the fearful. It's deliverance to the captive. In the desperate point between time and eternity, it is Jesus to save and it's the Lord to govern. It's our keeper. It's our guide. It's our shelter. See, some of you is coming to your feet. I don't feel an ounce of nothing. But it's emotional. 
hope we're not sinking this ship right now. <laughs> it's emotional. We get there, we get a little natural light, a little spiritual light, and we think, whoa, we really, no, no, no. Then you come to the real enemy. Your real enemy is not the devil. Some people say, the devil made me do it. Oh, quit blaming the devil. The devil's got bigger fish to fry than you. The devil's nowhere around Lufkin right now. The biggest enemy you're going to fight, young person, is not some other young person criticizing you or talking about you or trying to steal your boyfriend. The biggest enemy you're going to fight is not some spirit that comes into your bedroom at night and roars at you and says, I'm going to take you. No. You want to find out the real devil you're going to have to fight? When you get back to the dorm, go find you a mirror. Look in that mirror. That's going to be the greatest enemy you have to fight is your flesh. Because there's something about man that wants to do it himself. He wants to remain in control. Is this making sense, everybody? And so you can only go six paces, and that's as far as you can go. Because the seventh step is God's step. Where the Spirit says, you can't do this on your own. And this is the only one I know how to tell you, and if you disagree, disagree. But where the Spirit reaches through the veil, whoa, when you've got blood in one hand and worship in the other, and the Spirit reaches through the veil and says, the only way you can come in here is by a sovereign work of the Spirit. You tell me how it happens. You tell me how it happens. You tell me how it takes place in a Pentecostal church service where all of a sudden something takes over. And it's beyond the shout and the dance. I'm not knocking that. It's beyond the emotional something. All of a sudden, you're standing on one side of the veil, and the next thing you know, you're on the other. And the only way to get there is you've got to have blood. And you've got to have, not praise, worship. <laughs> Will you let me preach to you just a little, little while longer? I don't know where else we got to go. See, see, I have always thought it not fair to think that I only have one shot at the rapture. Hmm. Now, let me ask you guys a question. What, what's going to make heaven heaven? Thank you. Is it the presence of God? Now, we talk about the rapture. We, we got this concept, and now just, just listen to me a second. We have this concept that it's some abrupt threshold. That there's only one shot at the rapture. But really, that's not true. <laughs> that's what I thought. Every day of your life, you get a shot at the rapture. That's right. The rapture is when you step beyond the flesh. Oh, God. And you go out of time into eternity. I'm fixing to preach now. Amen. You step out of this world into a world where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more sickness. Is that not true? Now, now we've, we've already established what makes heaven heaven is God. It's the fact that it's eternity. Is that not true? It's eternity. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the difference between a person in prayer where they move out of time into eternity? Boom. Basically, the only difference is when the rapture takes place, your body's completely gone, the flesh. And it's eternal now. But what happens to you when that seventh step takes place is you actually transcend from time into eternity. Boom. Oh, God, I'm, 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 I'm losing some of you right here. 
Everybody that makes sense, wave your hand right now. Because I don't lose your hair. If I lose your hair, the whole sermon's shot. It's all of a sudden where something happens where you go from being trapped in time to where you go into that eternal arena. It's the holy of holies. It's where God dwells. It's where there is no wisdom of the mind. It's all the wisdom of God. It is all divine illumination. There's no natural light in there. It's all spiritual light. It's not look what I can do. It's look at what the Spirit can do. Look at what the Spirit says. Look at what the Spirit expresses. It's where God speaks mysteries to you. It is where heaven unveils itself. It's where the presence of God allows you to step into and meddle with eternal affairs. It's where you actually work with the Spirit. Jesus. And I'm telling you, in 1999, we don't have enough people who know about it. Now, I'm going to shock some of you right here. See, what we're after in this camp is not just to come to the holy place. I beg God this afternoon, Lord, let the glory of God come into this place. Who's the principal here? What? Wedgworth? He got to talking today about a camp that he attended where a blue mist and a blue haze come into it. See, some of you have never seen stuff like that. Because you've only come to an emotional place with God. And you've never been allowed to go beyond the veil of the flesh. To enter into a place where when you see it, it literally transforms your life. I'm losing, I'm losing. And changes you forever. It's more than just a good feeling. It's when you're in the raw presence of God. It's where the light of God's glory, the Shekinah, comes into the place. And you stand in awe and in fear of the Lord Himself. Now, let me tell you something. You talk about the scripture that says to those, He's coming back after those who love His glorious appearing. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you think when the rapture takes place that you will love His glorious appearing any more than you would love His glorious appearing on a Sunday night in your local church? When the presence of God comes in, whoa, when the eternal in a- atmosphere comes in, boom, there it is. And you yawn and scratch your head and talk and pass notes, and you don't even comprehend it. If you think you're rapture ready, you got another thought coming. Every church service, God gives you the ability to transcend from time into eternity. You shouldn't be preaching this. These campers and these kids, they don't comprehend it. They comprehend more than you understand. And if we're going to reach our world, it's not coming through a song and a dance and a program. It's coming because somebody has stepped into the presence of God and a live coal cut from out the altar and touched their lips. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something, some, some of you something here. See, when there is a move of the Spirit in a church service and you can't enter into it, when you're praying in your, in your private prayer and something's got you blocked from moving into it, that's God telling you, you better take inventory. I'm showing you now. Something is keeping you from being rapture ready. When the Holy Ghost goes to sweep and cross a youth camp and 20 or 30 percent of them enter into it and the rest of them are just kind of looking around wondering what's going to happen. That's the Holy Ghost signifying. You can't enter in, can you? You can't come in here, can you? You're having a hard time getting in, aren't you? And if you can't get in now, what makes you think you can get in then? There's something in your life blocking you from being able to enter to the... And worship in the other. (laughs) 
My God. My God. Shondo Robahai. Kita la Bohoshan. You're not hungry for it? That's fine. Somebody else will be. You don't want to go. I'm going to tell you something. One trip into the Holy of Holies. When you come out, you will say this. I don't care what it costs me to get in there. Take it. Take it. One Are are y'all through? Can can you take a little more? One prayer meeting where you participate with God. And God says, the only way I can get it done is I have to use somebody. But there's too few that will enter into this place with me. Where I can use your hands and your feet and your voice You see, if the Spirit's going to pray, it's got to pray through your vocal cords. And how many times have we come into a church service and rushed by the veil and the whole time, if you could hear the sound coming from behind the veil, it was saying, please, would somebody join me in here? I'm a lonely God in here. There's too few that know about this. I'm not preaching that I'm a good example of it. My God, there's been times the Spirit has beckoned, and I've been so busy and so under the gun and under pressure and trying to get here and there. I wonder how many times that the Spirit said, Come on, Mark Morgan, come in here with me for a while. I'll show you mysteries. I'll show you things to come. I will allow you to see what's happening in eternity. Let me tell you why your flesh and the devil doesn't want you in there. Because if he can keep you trapped in time, he can wear you out. I feel the Holy Ghost and I feel my help here right now. You see, as a creature of time, I'm beat down with things that I have to face today. I'm beat down with my problems. I don't see the end of the problem. Do you hear me? My God, I wish I could open your brains up. I hope the Holy Ghost will help us tonight. If I could somehow get a majority of you to see this and to comprehend it and get hungry for it. You're talking about a revival sweeping our churches. You're talking about a revival sweeping our nation. Listen to me. Listen to me. You are, some of you are struggling with things and you don't think there's a way out and you don't see the end because you're trying to see through the eyes of the flesh. You're in situations right now, you're thinking, what what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? How do I beat this? How do I defeat this? Because you're trying to beat a spiritual enemy in the arena of the flesh, and you can't do it. That's his leverage against you is your flesh. Knows how to wear you down through the flesh and the lust of the flesh. He knows how to appeal to you. That's why the enemy in your flesh doesn't want you to step beyond that veil. Because if you step beyond the veil, the Holy Ghost says, you come with me for a while. I'll show you victories of tomorrow. It looks bad today. And it looks like you're trapped here. But if you just come over here in eternity with me, I'll show you down the road where there's a victory. And I'll let you taste at the victories of tomorrow. Then when you come back from eternity into time, you sing that song of old. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. He'll wear you out, wear you down. But there's something about having a prayer meeting and getting beyond the veil where the Spirit opens it up. Here it is. How many young preachers do we have in this building right now? Can I see your hand? Come on. Whether you've ever preached or not, you feel a call to preach. I want you to put your hand in the air. I'm going to give you some good advice and you listen to me. How many of you want to have an effective ministry? How many of you really want something to happen in your ministry in your life? I'm going to tell you how it happens. I'm going to tell you exactly how it happens. Somewhere in that afternoon, somewhere in that day, you get alone with God. And whatever it takes, you fight your way through your problems in your flesh until you step in that eternal arena. And the Holy Ghost says, come here. 
I want to show you the service tonight. I want to show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you people that I'm going to deliver. I'm going to show you people that's going to get the Holy Ghost. Then when you walk to the pulpit, you're not stumbling and fumbling around. You're not wondering if God can or if God will. You've already seen it in the Spirit. You've already identified it in the Holy Ghost. Then when you walk to the pulpit, it's not with arrogance, but it's with the confidence of the Spirit. I've already seen the end result. I know where to preach, and I know what to preach to. If you don't have that in your life, you walk to the pulpit and you'll preach through your own earthly wisdom and intellect and power. And you'll get a few results and you may get people hyped up and you may call it revival. But I'm telling you, when the demonstration of the Spirit starts and people go beyond the veil, something mighty happens. It's where lives are changed. It's where lives are transformed. It's where the eternal presence of God reveals himself. It's the seventh step. Jesus. Jesus. Those of you in the front, come in just as close as you can. Step in as close as you can to make room for others coming. He's calling us. He's calling us. He's calling us. He's calling us. I hear the voice of my beloved beyond the veil. I hear him calling. Come to me, my love. Take that seventh step. Some of you need to ask God to cleanse you with his blood right now. You'll not go any further until real repentance comes to your life. And you ask the blood to cleanse you. And you ask the blood to wash you. Jesus. Now every, every one of you standing here, purpose in your mind, I am not leaving this altar until I break through. More than just a good feeling, something's got to happen to my life. Something's got to change me right here. God help me to take that seventh step where I go beyond my own intellect and understanding and I step into the holy of holies where something changes where you reveal yourself to me where I no longer care about the flesh come on just pray a little while the Lord's working here I got a feeling in this altar service, this camp's fixing to step through a door of the Spirit. He told a hoshatal out of Baha'i. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Morgan, you're making it real heavy. We'll shout the next two nights. We're going to get somewhere now. Come on, do you hear him calling you? Can you hear beyond the veil of the flesh? Can you hear the beckoning call of the eternal God? Come join me. Come participate with me. Come help me. That's it, young man. Blood in one hand. Blood in one hand. 
worship in the other. A cleansing on one part and worship on the other. Cleanse me, O Lord. Purge me with hyssop. Purge me with hyssop. Purge me with hyssop. Come on, ask the Lord. Help me, Holy Ghost, not to be a stranger to the work of the Spirit. Help me not to be a stranger to the depth of the Spirit. For no man knoweth the things of God save the Spirit of God. Help me, God. Help me now, Lord. Help me, God. Come on, pray. That's it, pray. Help me, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Come on, some of you starting to break for the first time. God, don't let anything keep me from entering in. God, don't let anything hinder me from breaking through this. I've got to go beyond the flesh. I've got to go beyond it. Come on, pray a repentant prayer. Brother Morgan, we've already done this. Pray it again. Come on, let his blood cleanse you. Some of you are struggling with guilt. Some of you are struggling with shame. The devil's telling you you can never get past this. And you know what? He's right. As long as he keeps you trapped in the flesh, you will never get past it. Keep repenting until you feel like you've got it all out. You've got it all clean. You've got it all under the blood. When you feel like the blood's done its work in your life, I want you to enter into worship if you can. I want you to begin to worship God from your heart. He's coming, don't worry, he's coming, he's coming to help you.
Jesus. 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 I'm going through. Jesus. I'm getting past this. Jesus. Help me now, Holy Ghost. Come on, something's breaking in here right now. Jesus. I ain't staying on the fleshly side of Jordan. I'm going across. Jesus. 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 You're through repenting. I want you to put your hands in there and start calling on his name. Come on, worship him. Fervently worship him. I'm going through this flesh. I'm getting past this situation. I'm going past this condemnation and guilt. I'm going past this problem. Come on, you got blood in one hand, now get worship in the other. He'll take you there. How do I get there, preacher? Just praise and worship him. He'll get you there. It's a work of the Spirit. I don't know. It's not for you to understand. Shanda Bakai. Come on, this is where miracles happen right here. Some of you are fixing to get lost in the spirit right now. Some of you are fixing to enter a place. Oh, you're fixing to go there. When you step in there, something's going to happen in your spirit. Something's going to happen in your life. Something's going to change. My God. My God. He told my Hashanda. Come on, Texas Youth Camp. God's trying to take you somewhere. The Holy Ghost is trying to bring you into something. I have not seen hath not heard neither hath it entered to the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them victory's coming victory's coming Jesus Jesus some of you are stepping through the flesh. Some of you is going past the veil now. Some of you is getting in there. Some of you is looking in that room right now. Some of you is starting to sense it. It's getting a hold of some of you now. Some of you feel something. I'm getting louder, preacher. I feel something happening in my spirit. I feel something going on in the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah.
please like, comment, and subscribe.